Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome everybody um, to the 3.30 session. I've got you at your postprandial best. My name is Peter W. I'm from LSU in New Orleans at what is now University Medical Center, used to be Charity Hospital and still affiliated with the emergency medicine residency there um, with just an outstanding group of residents who continue to inspire me. Uh, the purpose of this talk was created literally about 28 years ago um, after completing my pulmonary critical care fellowship. I wanted to make sure that we were able to educate people on the utility of vasopressors in a logical fashion. Since that time, the amount of evidence that we have now is tremendously increased and buoyed. So we're going to go quickly. It's a lot of information. I just want to point out to you two things. First, this is my email. So if you're looking for a handout, email me and I will send you a PDF. I'm not going to be back in New Orleans until Thursday, but if you email me, I promise to send you the PDF. So peter.w. D-E-B-L-I-U-X, at lcmchealth.org. Um, so we're going to go through, we were going to go through, Danelle, my man. Was there a, no, it's supposed to be that one. So the good thing is we'll be able to go through the objectives pretty quickly. Well, I'm going to let you work on that okay. while I do this. This is not. Yes, sir. While Danelle ably plays with that, we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, so the first premise is one of cardiopulmonary reserve. The concept being that your heart, lungs, and hemoglobin are interconnected. And this is what, is what we're going to target when we start talking about vasoactive agents. Um, because if, in fact, your tank is low and you need hemoglobin, we have to replace that with our hemoglobin. If the issue is your heart, we're going to approach this in a different fashion. And if your lung is involved, we have to play with that understanding as well. I would just say that there is, you're going to see a lot of data and all the references are there, but it's important to understand that each of your patients is unique and, you know, this, this isn't a one-size-fits-all. And we'll talk about everything from sepsis to cardiogenic shock all the way, are we back up? All, all the way back to um, cervical spine injuries and the spinal shock that's associated there as well. So the first case is the case of a patient who comes into you. Um, they have substernal chest pain that's lasted for over eight hours. And that patient um, has an EKG that shows Q waves over the anterior leads. So it looks all, all the world to be a fresh MI. The patient presents to you hypotensive and tachycardic. It's a pretty awful mix, right? Because you've had an MI, they're ischemic, you'd like to see them compensate. They can't because they're hypotensive and now their heart rate is going up. The higher their heart rate goes up, the greater their myocardial oxygen consumption, which just feeds into the ongoing ischemia. So when you start thinking about this, there's some pretty important tenets um, to understand and for us to embrace for cardiogenic shock. You know, historically, you're going to love this, historically, if you open up the ACLS manual, the American Heart Association, not to disparage um, any particular group, but the American Heart Association um, says that if the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, is less than 90, then we should reach for a particular agent. And that's not the agent that our 
cardiothoracic surgery colleagues would push on. So just so that you understand this, the people who see the greatest number of patients in cardiogenic shock, the greatest number, are going to be cardiothoracic surgeons. And the reason is they're taking people off of pump every day in the operating room. And as they take people off of pump, they have to reach for an agent. The agent that they reach for with reliability is dobutamine. That is that agent. So let's talk about dobutamine for just a second. Dobutamine is not a true vasopressor. It is a vasoactive agent, but it is not a vasopressor. It does two things. It's a positive inotrope, so if all things being equal, I increase forward flow, I'm going to elevate blood pressure. Are we down with that concept? That inotropic piece. It is a vasodilator. That's right. So it's going to vasodilate the aorta to offload the work of the left ventricle. So if my inotropic properties of dobutamine predominate, I'll have a small increase in blood pressure. If the vasodilatory components of dobutamine predominate, then I'll have a small drop in blood pressure. If they cancel each other out, it's null. There'll be no alteration in blood pressure, just so that we're aware of that. So that's dobutamine. Now what the cardiothoracic surgeons will say is start with dobutamine and see what you get and then quickly add levofed norepinephrine to the mix. There's two things that we want to avoid, two things that we want to stay away from. Number one is phenylephrine, neosinephrine. And you'll be scratching your head and say, no, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a great agent because it's just you know, it works on alpha and alpha only, so it should cause just vasoconstriction. You're absolutely right. It does work on alpha and it does cause vasoconstriction, but it also causes reflex bradycardia. So if you want to clutch yourself and be nervous, then you would be nervous behind an agent that leaves you with a hypotensive patient who is now bradycardic. And it is not predictable. So you can avoid that at all costs. The second agent, thank you, the second agent is going to be epinephrine. And the number of studies now, including one published this year, links epinephrine with poor outcomes and raised mortality in the setting of acute MI. So let's, oh, look at this. We got objectives, cardiopulmonary reserve, which we talked about, our first case which looks all the world to be acute MI, and then what's the best vasoactive agent in this setting? And so we talked about this already, and we're gonna, first one we're gonna reach for is dobutamine. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. The pathophysiology, it's primary pump failure. There's limited cardiac output. Here's the real screwy thing is it releases interleukin-6. And I'm not trying to get geek on you, but interleukin-6 is the same vasoactive substance that's released in sepsis. So you're now thinking this is vasodilatory shock. Interleukin-6, same thing happens, by the way, in post-cardiac arrest. They now call it a post-cardiac arrest syndrome. And you need to be wary of this, because we'll see frank hypotension Post-arrest, we'll also see it in about with large MIs involving the left ventricle in over 50% of cases. So one out of every two patients that you're going to manage. Decreased contractility, a secondary inflammatory cascade. This interleukin-6 is released even if they go to cath lab, knock out a clot, stent, and have reperfusion. You'll see interleukin-6. So this is ACLS, and this is where it gets screwy. This is what they've said since 1992. This doesn't mean this is where, I'm, where I am with my reading, right? I just want you to know the historical data of this, and it's been rubber stamped for every edition of ACLS, sadly. So systolic blood pressure less than 90, dobutamine if it's less than 80, dopamine, and if it's less than 70, levofed. And really, our cardiothoracic surgeons who deal with this daily say first line is dobutamine and call for norepi at the bedside. So that's what we should be doing. Both of those agents, both dobutamine and norepinephrine, are pennies. 
So if you have them mixed and ready to go, and they're just sitting at the bedside, you haven't broken any bank that exists. However, if now the patient becomes hypotensive after being normotensive, and you're now calling pharmacy, and they're having to mix those drips for you, and you're waiting 30 minutes to 45 minutes, it's a little bit more trouble. So this is the data for epinephrine creating a problem. And they looked at a threefold increase in 90-day mortality. Um, and again, it's associated with increased myocardial stress, injury, and also renal dysfunction. Dopamine, as an agent, increases tachydysrhythmic events. So you're much more likely to get PVCs and sinus um, tach, as well as ventricular tachycardia. What I want to drive home, and this comes from critical points, a separate course that we've generated, it really is a great tenet, and this is the same tenet for sepsis as well as cardiogenic shock. I want you to think of it like this. We're addressing the tank, and by the tank we mean preload status. So we're assessing preload status with our best technology, probably right now passive leg raise associated with pulse pressure variation. And if that's all new to you, then you'll, you'll see some references later on. If the patient looks like they'll be volume responsive, in cardiogenic shock, we're going to give 250 cc's of normal saline over five minutes and reassess. 250, not two liters, 250 and reassess as long as it looks like the patient can tolerate a fluid bolus. If, through our assessment and our estimation, the patient cannot tolerate a fluid bolus, we quickly reach for levofed. Dobutamine as well in setting of cardiogenic shock. So for pump failure, again, I just want you to be aware of about 50% of these patients will be hypotensive, the 250 cc boluses, we're going to consider in cardiogenic shock the benefit of positive pressure ventilation. So think about this for a minute. If I have left ventricular dysfunction and fluid is now backing into my lungs because it's not going forward flow, I want to reduce my venous return. One of the best ways to reduce my venous return is going to be with the advent of positive pressure ventilation. Whether you choose BiPAP or whether you choose intubation with mechanical ventilation doesn't matter if you're talking about abject shock. That will reduce venous return. It will offload the left ventricle and allow for more efficiency of flow. So if you look at this echo, this is just a quick look echo. This is compliments of Justin Cook, one of my colleagues for critical points out of Oregon. I want you to be able to look at that heart and say, that is a wimpy heart. I'm not looking for you to estimate what the ejection fraction is. Because it really doesn't matter from our standpoint whether this is 15% or it's 20% or it's 25%. It's a wimpy heart. And we're going to treat that in a particular manner. I have great confidence in your ability to look at two different echoes and to be able to distinguish a vigorous left ventricle from a wimpy left ventricle. And so if we look at these two, on the left, this is vigorous. The ventricular walls are almost kissing each other. That's a strong EF. And we compare that to the one on the right that's barely squeezing, that's barely getting by. We're going to treat these two differently. In the setting of shock, in the setting of shock, we're going to start off with the one on the left with a fluid bolus, and we might repeat that two, even three times before we reach for another agent. And that other agent in this vigorous LV is not going to be dobutamine. You, this does not need inotropic help. If this were associated with cardiogenic shock, and a low blood pressure, this would almost all be linked to interleukin-6 and the vasodilatory component of shock. We're going to treat that with levofed. The one on the right desperately needs dobutamine. You may start with a 250cc bolus. You're going to assess your tank status and then move quickly on from there. 
So when we talk about hose, we talk about systemic vascular resistance, and this is all norepinephrine. This is going to be our drug du jour, particularly for cardiogenic shock in 2018. I very much hope to tell you in 2019 that this will be now angiotensin II, because I think we're going to get to that, and I'll tell you more about that in a bit. But we're not there yet with the evidence. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors have long half-life that limit their ability. So this is amrinone, not amiodarone, but amrinone. It's expensive, and its half-life is very long. So we're better off with dobutamine. Phenylephrine, if you heard me speak about before, causes unopposed alpha, and this can lead to bradycardia. This is something that we would avoid. There is a strong argument for early intervention. Revascularization improves ultimate outcome. However, you can still be having abject hypotension in the setting of revascularization. Intraaortic balloon pump, say no to that. Therapeutic hypothermia and arrest, say yes. So case two, a 64-year-old woman presents with EMS as a full code. CPR is in progress, paramedics have established IV access, and the patient is intubated. The monitor reveals asystole. So post-arrest, vasopressor support in more than 50% of these patients. Left ventricular dysfunction, we talked about that pathophysiology. There's myocardial stunning, as well as catecholamine excess. This is the post-cardiac arrest syndrome that I referred to earlier. It's defined as a systolic blood pressure less than 90, one hour post-ICU admission. This is a great study. They looked at patients with hypotension. They had a mortality of 65% compared to normotensive patients that had a mortality of 37%. So our ability to intervene on these patients quickly saves lives. So this is the study. They looked at a goal mean arterial blood pressure. So I want you to shake what your normal practice habit is, because I know everybody in the room you know, spent the last 15 years saying, we've got a mean arterial blood pressure of 65. That's our goal. We're going to shoot with 65. For post-cardiac arrest syndrome, we want a higher pressure. The reason we want a higher pressure is the bulk of these pa patients have what past medical history? They have a hypertensive past medical history, which shifts their perfusion curve to the right, which means they benefit from a little bit higher blood pressure. Some people use 80, some people use 75. So just so that you're aware of that. In this study, when they used the pressure of 80 to 100, they had an improvement in mortality of 50% compared to controls at 78%. So some of the pearls, we're going to uh, act we're going to use our bedside ultrasound. We're going to also look at pulse pressure variation to assess our volume status, what I call tank, and the benefit of fluid boluses. We're going to consider the heart rate. If they're tachycardic, we're going to stay away from agents that drive that heart rate up. And the goal is a mean arterial blood pressure, 75 plus. So the third case. A 32-year-old woman in status post C-section delivery four days ago. She returns from radiology. She's waving the results of her high-probability CT scan. She suddenly becomes agitated. Her SATs drop. Her blood pressure is now 80 over 40. Her pulse is 132. Her respiratory rate is 34. You give a fluid bolus of two liters of normal saline. This results not in an increase in her blood pressure, but actually a decrease in her blood pressure. This is massive PE. So what's the best option for vasoactive agents in the setting of pulmonary embolus and shock with a blood pressure of 70 over 40? Would you reach for dobutamine? Would you reach for dopamine? Would you reach for norepinephrine? Would you reach for epinephrine? Okay? The evidence is norepinephrine, but that evidence, this is kind of crazy, is based on animal models. So I'll show you that in a bit. So what we have pathophysiologically, just so that we're all there together. So the pathophys is acute pulmonary hypertension. 
just acute. And as my pulmonary arteries squeeze down, what does that do to my right ventricle? Your choice is it gets smaller, stays the same, or it gets bigger. It gets bigger. There we go. It gets bigger. So when that happens, check it out. So this is your right ventricle. Are we there? This is your left ventricle. In the setting of acute pulmonary hypertension, this gets bigger. This is your septum. What happens to your septum? So what happens to your left ventricular filling? It goes down. And what happens to your cardiac output? It goes down. What happens to your blood pressure? It goes down. Check it out. I give a fluid bolus, what happens? It gets worse. Now that doesn't mean with massive PE, every fluid bolus is associated with worsening blood pressure. However, if you're thinking PE, you give a fluid bolus and the blood pressure gets worse, guess what? Don't give another fluid bolus. It's pretty straight up. Um, so that's important. And again, this isn't, this isn't I'm clever and you're not. This is I've made those mistakes. You don't have to, right? You can learn from them. And so this is massive PE. And don't you wish that all the studies came with red arrows? It'd be so much easier. So there's no human data. It's limited norepinephrine. And the guy who did this is one of my colleagues who was my you know, closest professor during my fellowship. And so pig lab, improved survival, improved cardiac output, improved coronary blood flow with minimal changes in pulmonary vasculature. And this is kind of cool because we already have vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries. What do you think dopamine does to pulmonary vascular resistance? Worsens it. It's pretty wild. Whereas levofed has less of an effect on the pulmonary vasculature. Now, there are some anecdotal studies using epinephrine and dobutamine, also amrinone, with some success. But you're going to avoid fluid loading for these patients. So what are the pearls? We're going to use ultrasound early. Again, some of the easy things to do with ultrasound is looking for the dilation of the right heart. What's even easier is if you got the CT looking for PE study, and you look at the right ventricle, and the right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle, you've made your diagnosis of this acute pulmonary hypertension. In those patients, we should be thinking about thrombolytics. There's just some recent data that shows for moderate PE, no benefit from thrombolytics. But for massive PE, we still show benefit. And this is a pearl that I want to share with you, is when I have the massive PE patient, and they're there in front of me, I ask for ultrasound of the lower extremities. My residents, my fellow attendings are scratching their heads saying, you've made the diagnosis. Why do you want to look at their lower extremities? If there's clot burden in those lower extremities, the patient is already hypotensive, what's the next clot going to do? I call it DRT. They'll be dead right there, right? It's a clean kill. And so in those patients, you want the temporary vena cava filter. You have heavy lower extremity clot burden, and the patient is already hypotensive. The next clot that flips off and joins that burden is going to kill them. So the fourth case. A 64-year-old man presents with a change in mental status and flank pain. Initial vital signs are a pulse of 142, blood pressure of 70 over 30, a respiratory rate of 36, and a temperature of 41. A Foley is placed in about 200 cc's of frank pus returns. He's received four serial boluses, 500 cc's of Ringer's lactate, without any improvement in his blood pressure. You want to say, change a shift, right? So what are the options for vasoactive agents in the treatment of septic shock? Are we going to reach for dopamine in this patient with a heart rate of 142? Are we going to reach for epinephrine? Are we going to reach for norepinephrine? Or are we going to reach for phenylephrine? I will tell you 
that if we were in Germany right now, we were in Germany right now, they would choose epinephrine. They would. And we'll go over that. However, in the U.S., we're going to go with levofed. So septic shock, a reduction in systemic vascular resistance, the same inflammatory cascade, interleukin-6, all these nasty things that cause vasodilatory shock, and then cardiac output is typically, when we're seeing them in the ED, typically elevated. Vital signs are inadequate endpoints in determining the response to circulation. Let me see if this sounds familiar to you. Patient came in hypotensive. We gave a fluid bolus, the blood pressure came up, then the blood pressure went back down. Then we gave a fluid bolus, and the blood pressure came up, and we admitted the patient. And then you hear <coughs> uh, rapid response, room 502. Not that that has ever happened to you, because it only happens to me, right? And so that's not uncommon. Just because the blood pressure came up and the heart rate came down doesn't mean our job is done doesn't mean their risk is over. And lactate helps us with that, and lactate clearance is a, is a marker for those patients who are more likely to survive their hospitalization. So epinephrine and septic shock, just two quick studies. One comparing head-to-head -head epi to norepi, and guess what they found? Equivalent outcome data. Okay, so that makes sense, and you're like, okay, I'll give them that. The next study was epinephrine compared to dobutamine plus norepi. And you know what they found? Identical outcomes. That's why in Germany, they will just reach for epinephrine. Vasopressin. So vasopressin is a great agent, right? Your hypothalamus pushes this stuff out in the setting of shock. When you're completely depleted, right, this has gone on, you're completely depleted, your body needs the maintenance stress dose of vasopressin. That's why this 0.03 units per minute is the dose. They've looked at this as a titrating dose to ramp it up, and you know what they found? They were killing more people. So they don't do it. It's a fix. This is your maintenance stress dose of vasopressin. And so we talked about the first piece, which is the tank, which is assessing preload status. We do this with ultrasound looking at IVC and collapsibility of the IVC. The better utility now is for pulse pressure variation and pulse pressure amplitude changes that occur with passive leg raises. The hose piece is systemic vascular resistance, and that's norepinephrine. And then the pump piece is, again, looking with the bedside ultrasound to the LV function. And again, all I want you to be able to do is drop the probe on the chest and to distinguish between a hyperdynamic heart and a hypokinetic heart, one that's barely squeezing. Because the hyperdynamic heart is not getting dobutamine. The hypokinetic heart is. So again, the tank, we're looking for ultrasound and pulse pressure variation. This is part of the handout. I'm happy to give that to you. The hose, our goal for sepsis, our goal for sepsis remains 65. Remember I told you before, cardiogenic shock, where 75 plus mean arterial blood pressure, that data does, is not cross over to sepsis. We're still at 65 for sepsis. And again, that's that algorithm. For pump, this is really left ventricular function, understanding that even in sepsis, in sepsis, one out of every two patients in sepsis has left ventricular dysfunction. So there's a lot of that going on. Cardiogenic shock, same number. Septic shock, same number. Angiotensin II. New boy on the block. You know what you call this? Expensive care medicine. It's a lot of money. So 
Vasodilatory shock, they're not just limiting themselves to sepsis, they're looking at cardiogenic as well. Currently only two classes of vasopressors. One is catechols, which we've already, already reviewed, and the other is vasopressin. They work in two different fashions. This is a third fashion. This is the renin-angiotensin system. So it's brand new. And this is what's exciting about it. It increases mean arterial blood pressure on those patients who are requiring other vasopressors and are still in shock. Those people with moderate to high levels of levofed and are still in shock, we add angiotensin II on board and we can wean the levofed down. Now this is where it's really crazy exciting. There's a trend in decreased 28-day mortality and greater liberation from renal replacement therapy, so less likely to go on dialysis. What we've not published yet are head-to-head -head studies looking at levofed to angiotensin II. We don't have that data yet. And we certainly don't have it for cardiogenic shock either, but it makes sense in that disease state as well for vasodilatory shock. We may even see it for anaphylactic shock. We're not there yet. We're still holding on to epinephrine for that. But I would anticipate in this next year, you're going to see the published data. This is some of this has just come out in the last few months in regards to mortality changes with angiotensin II. So sepsis pearl, no difference. Currently, evidence-based medicine supports norepinephrine over dopamine, and it's equivalent to epinephrine in those head-to-head -head studies. Angiotensin II will be coming. It'll be interesting to see if it's just a tag-along with norepi or if it's a standalone titratable agent. We want to utilize ultrasound to look for volume status, arterial waveform analysis, pulse pressure variation, very important. Dobutamine care, again, vasodilatory properties associated with sepsis mean that we should be using the probe looking at the left ventricle to assess LV dysfunction. So case five, a 19-year-old man has sustained a high C-spine injury at C2 due to a trampoline accident. His neurological injury is complete at the C2, C3 level. Vital signs of pulse of 62, a blood pressure of 82 over 44, respiratory rates 18. He's been given four liters of normal saline and his blood pressure has not responded. When you see these patients, as long as they don't have a head injury, they'll have these woefully low blood pressures, they'll make urine, and they'll be talking to you, like normal talking to you. It's freaky, right? Because you've got this low heart rate and a low blood pressure, and everybody else you see that looks like that has a tube in their throat, and they're connected to a mechanical ventilator, and they're circling a drain. These guys, and it's typically guys, it's a testosterone associated event where you go really fast and come to a screeching halt and you wind up with cord injuries. There's a, it's like nine to one um, predominance with this. So these are tough patients. So what are we going to go to? What are we going to reach for? Are we going to go to milrinone, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor? Are we going to go to dobutamine? Are we going to go to phenylephrine? Are we going to go to dopamine? What do you think we should do? Because Levo's not on there, baby. I know, you're like, damn, I was going to pick it. I was going to get it right this time. So this is the dopamine dog, and this is why. Low heart rate. Low, this is the perfect setting to add dopamine, right, because it's going to drive the heart rate up. So we're not surprised by this. It's due to the loss of sympathetic tone of the heart and of the vasculature. Again, resultant bradycardia and low SVR. Now this is what we get worried about. At this guy that I presented to you at C2, C3, you're not going to make a difference, right? There, there, there's really not going to make a difference. You suddenly bolster his blood pressure, you're not going to make a difference. But if we make this at the C5, 6 level, and you can bolster his blood pressure, we have the chance to make sure that this guy independently lives with the wheelchair and can use part of his hand to drive that wheelchair.
as opposed to blowing through a straw for the rest of his life. Right? So it's a big deal. Head on a bed versus independent with a wheelchair. And this is the penumbra that surrounds that cord injury. So on either side of that cord injury, there's recoverable tissue, but if we leave that recoverable tissue ischemic, their neurofunction can actually worsen. And so maximizing mean arterial blood pressure with fluids and dopamine offers the best event, and they actually like they actually like numbers in the 75 range as well. There's zero evidence, zero evidence for our neurosurgical colleagues to come up with 75 as a number. Just it's kind of a cool number, so they picked it. Um, but that's what the reality is. Now, I'm going to go on just a little bit about push dose pressors. Um, so, Anecdotal experience abounds with precious little evidence-based medicine on push-dose presser. I, would, I will grant you ease and speed of access needs to be balanced by our inability to accurately use these agents. And I know that we've learned from our anesthesia colleagues, because our anesthesia colleagues have been doing this stuff for years, right? Just because they've been doing it for years and not measuring its effect doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And it certainly doesn't mean it's the safe thing to do. The best application tends to be an RSI with associated hypotension. But again, I can't point to studies where it's been used and we can say this is safely used as opposed to something else. In theory, in theory, I equate this with hypertensive emergencies. Hypertensive urgencies, in fact. We don't rapidly lower blood pressure. Why is that? <laughs> causes stroke, causes MI, causes kidney disease. Can actually unmask any type of STEAL, S-T-A-L, syndrome you want to invent. Cerebral myocardial, renal, GI. If we rapidly lower your blood pressure and we've been right-sided dependent, right, chronic hypertension, and we suddenly drop it, we get into trouble. That's why we use titratable agents. That's why we do that, because we hurt people. Now, I can't tell you that push-dose pressors hurt people, but I can tell you it doesn't make sense to me that we would push a dose and have this response to blood pressure come up and then back down. It's not like it's a titratable dose. And people say, well, it doesn't stick around that long. I'm not worried about it sticking around that long. I'm worried about how high it goes and what injuries occur. I would much rather have a titratable agent, a levofed there, and titrate it so that I can be ready. Now, again, how many push dose Presser administrations are enough, right? Well, I did it once and I did it a second time. Now I'm going to do it a third time as opposed to having a mixed bag of levofed and having the patient on a drip and know exactly where I am and where we're going with this. Having said that, having said that, I think it would be irresponsible for me to talk about push dose pressers and then not show you how to mix it, right? No, I do. No, I, look, I, I, you know, I've been accused of being a hater on push dose pressors. I'm not exactly a hater, I'm just not sold on it. There's two different things. This is how you mix it, but again, I, I would rather you order a levofed to the bedside early, right? And so who are you going to do that to? Well, my septic shock patient that responded to one fluid bolus, I'm not going to wait to see if they go low again. I'm going to have it at the bedside. The patient with a massive left-sided MI, um, the cardiac arrest patient. I'm calling for dobutamine and I'm calling for levofed at the bedside so that if they do get into trouble, it's easy for me to go ahead and say start it and titrate it. If I have the patient who I'm going to RSI and they're already low normotensive, got it? Low normotensive, then I'm going to have levofed at the bedside. 
during RSI. I'm going to do my best to resuscitate that patient prior to the insult that is RSI. Because you've got to ask yourself, the patient in shock that you're going to perform RSI to, I know that we were all taught ABC, but if we jump in a shock patient who has shock index, thank you, Alan Hefner, right? So if their heart rate's higher than their systolic blood pressure and we induce positive pressure ventilation, with predictability, those patients arrest. If we resuscitate them first, they're less likely to arrest. So the risks, inability to titrate, the need for redosing, reflex parasympathetic response of bradycardia with phenylephrine, and medication error doing to dosing and preparing these agents. Then also there's the mislabeling of syringes. So the treatment plan. Again, remember that each of your patients is unique and there's not a fixed recipe for everybody. Um, evaluate the need for ongoing therapy. I, I told you already that cardiogenic shock and post-cardiac arrest probably 75 plus on mean arterial blood pressure and for cord injury um, you're going to want to think about 75 as well plus. Everything else will be 65. Use the minimum dose required. Try and identify finite endpoints and give your nursing staff a range to shoot for. You know, in, in sepsis, I say shoot between 65 and 70. I give them a range. And then for post cardiac arrest, I go 75 to 80. And then utilize ultrasound early and often um, to, again, assess left ventricular function, to assess, assess tank status and your IVC and whether that's working or not. Um, so in summary, cardiogenic shock, dobutamine, plus or minus, levofed, pulmonary embolus, levofed, sepsis, norepinephrine, dobutamine in the setting of left ventricular dysfunction, epinephrine if you're in Germany, and vasopressin, hold on for hope for angiotensin II, tricyclics, you can use dobutamine in the setting of LV dysfunction, norepinephrine if the LV is vigorous, Spinal shock, look for dopamine, and anaphylaxis, we remain with epinephrine. So guys, thank you very much for your attention this late in the afternoon. Enjoy your scientific assembly.